Hi, this is Professor Jeff Ferriel at Capital University Law School in Contracts. The subject of this presentation is the scope of UCC Article 2. Let's first remind ourselves about the basic sources of contract law in the United States. The most important source of the common law of contracts is the common law. Judicial opinions, cases resolving disputes between parties where one party has sued another to present a breach of contract action. The common law is mostly state courts applying state law. However, occasionally we'll see a federal court involved, but the federal courts will still almost always be applying the state law of contracts. Another important source of contract law is the restatement of contracts. The restatement isn't really the law, but it's an influential, persuasive, secondary source about what the common law is. The restatement of contracts was drafted by members of the American Law Institute, who got together, really as a committee, and tried to articulate the common law in a set of simple, well, sometimes simple, sometimes complicated, black letter rules. The multi-volume version of the restatement is a particularly good source of examples about how the common law rules apply to a wide variety of commonly recurring situations. Another important source of contract law is the Uniform Commercial Code, and in particular Article 1 of the Uniform Commercial Code, which has a wide variety of definitions in it, and, with more details, Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, governing sales of goods. We'll spend a fair amount of time looking at how rules in Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code apply in sale of goods transactions a little bit differently than the common law applies to other transactions. The Uniform Commercial Code was drafted by the Uniform Law Commission back in the late 50s and early 60s and has now been adopted in, by state legislatures in all 53 states, including Ohio. You might wonder why I say 53 states. I'll bet you thought there were only 50 states. Well, you should take a look at the definition in UCC section 1201B and in particular its definition of state. You'll find that both the statutory text and the official comments are very useful. The official comments aren't formally adopted by state legislatures in most places, but they are, were drafted by the people who drafted the Uniform Commercial Code and provide useful guidance about the meaning of the statutory text. Because we have two sources of contract law, UCC Article 2 and the common law, a critical issue is when Article 2 applies and when the common law governs. When there's a conflict, because Article 2 is a statute adopted by state legislatures, if Article 2 applies, it supersedes the common law. After all, the legislature has the authority to say what the law is. Courts kind of just have to in order to resolve disputes between litigants in court. If the commercial code doesn't apply, then common law rules govern the transaction. However, there are going to be some situations where even if the transaction is within the scope of UCC Article 2, the common law will still apply. First, of course, UCC Article 2 might be silent about the issue that the court needs to resolve, and when the statute is silent, the court is going to have to resort back to the traditional common law methods of resolving disputes. There are also situations where the rules, the statutory rules in UCC Article 2, were specifically designed to supplement the common law, not replace it. Now let's talk about the basic scope of UCC Article 2. 
Take a look first at the language of UCC section 2-102. I'll wait for a moment while you find it. Okay, what does the language say? It begins by saying, unless the context otherwise requires, this article applies to transactions in goods. This language raises three initial issues. First, what are goods? Can you find a definition of goods? Look at the table of contents in the beginning of your statutory supplement and see if you can find a place where there's a definition of goods. Look at the definitions in section 1201 first, and then look at 2103, a defini definitions and an index of definitions. There you'll find a reference to section 2-105, and we'll be looking at 2105 a little bit later in just a moment to figure out what goods might be. The second issue raised by the language of 2102 is which transactions are covered. Does it apply to sales of goods? Does it cover, does it cover leases of goods? Does it cover a license to use goods? And the third issue, and we'll find later that transactions isn't defined anywhere, but there are some hints elsewhere about what transactions Article 2 applies. Additionally, the third issue is what does, when does the context require otherwise? That one's going to be a real puzzle that we'll worry about later on during the year. Now let's turn to section 2-105 subsection 1, what we'll learn to call 21051, and see how it defines goods. Look at the language, and I'll wait again a moment while you find it. Now let's take a look at the language. Goods means all things, including specially manufactured goods, which are movable at the time of identification to the contract for sale, other than money in which the price is to be paid, investment securities, and things in action. Goods also includes the young born young of animals and growing crops and other things attached to realty as described in the section on goods to be severed from realty, section 2-107. Pause the presentation for a moment, well, maybe a couple of min minutes, and make a list of the issues or questions raised by this statutory language. All right, now that you've made a list, let's see how your list compares with my list. The first item on my list is what are specially manufactured goods. A second is what is the time of identification. Do you see where that language appears in 21051? A third question is what is money? You'd think that would be pretty obvious, but in fact there's a definition in section 1201B of money, and there are some situations where a transaction involving money is not covered by Article 9 and other or Article 2, and other situations where a transaction in money is covered by Article 2. What's the difference between money in which the price is to be paid and money in some other context? Another issue is what are investment securities? together with what are things in action. What's meant by the unborn young of animals? What are growing crops? And what other things attach to realty under 2107? And I guess that means we're going to have to go read section 2107 also. All right, now that we've got our list of issues we're going to have to worry about eventually, let's, uh, let's take a look at the case of Pitley v. Hauser that I asked you to read. Go ahead and read Pitley v. Hauser. It's available on TWIN, 
and take some notes about the case, essentially make a brief of the case using the, uh, the brief format that you were taught during orientation. After you've read the case, ask yourself what the basic issue in the case is, and go ahead, pause here, and write it out. I'll wait while you do that. Secondly, what two rules does the court, in its opinion, discuss? Pause the tape here again and, uh, and write down the two rules that the court discusses. And then ask yourself which one of these two rules the court applied. Pause the video again and see which one the court applied. When you're done with that, ask yourself what another name for the predominant factor test is. Here, it'll be useful to look at Understanding Contracts, my little contracts hornbook, in section 105H1B. The Pitsley and Hauser case refers to the rule as the predominant factor test, but other courts refer to this same rule using slightly different terminology. Go look at understanding contracts and figure out what that different terminology is. Pause the video while you go look that up. What's the name for the alternate test that the court chose not to apply? Does the court give it a name? Well, here's another place where it might be useful to go look at section 105H1B in Understanding Contracts and see what name some courts have given to it. Finally, what reason did the court give for selecting the predominant factor test as the one to apply in the case? Once you've figured out the reason the court gave for applying the predominant factor test, you should notice that Pitley and Hauser involved a hybrid contract involving both goods and something else. In this case, carpet installation services. The predominant factor or predominant purpose test only needs to be invoked in situations involving hybrid contracts like the one in Pitley and Hauser. If the deal involves only goods with no services and nothing other than a sale of goods involved, it's not a hybrid contract and there's only one purpose so you don't have to figure out what purpose predominates. Likewise, if the transaction involves only services and there are no goods involved, there's only a single purpose and there's similarly no need to figure out which purpose predominates. So the first thing to figure out is whether you have a hybrid contract involving both goods and something else or a contract with a single purpose only involving a sale of goods, or only involving services, or only involving a transfer of real estate, or only involving some other, some other subject matter apart from goods. Let's look at some quick examples and see whether we think they involve a hybrid contract or a contract with a sole purpose. Figure out which of the following is a hybrid contract that necessitates using the predominant purpose test. First, a contract for the sale of a car where the buyer is going to pick the car up from the seller without any even delivery services by the seller. Is this a hybrid contract involving a sale of goods together with something else? Or is it a contract with only one purpose, the sale of goods? If it only has one purpose, then we don't have to worry about the predominant purpose test. It's a sale of goods, and Article 2 applies. 
Now, how about a contract for the sale of a car with the seller to install a trailer hitch on the car before the buyer picks it up? Is this a hybrid contract involving a sale of goods together with some services? Or is it a contract simply for the sale of goods with no accompanying services? How about a contract for the sale of land and a building? Are there any goods involved here? Well, you're going to go have to go back to figure out the definition, look at your definition of goods. But land and a building usually aren't movable at any time. So this is probably not a sale of goods. It's a sale of real estate. But there's no, nothing else involved, no goods involved, so it's not a hybrid contract. The sole purpose is the sale of real estate, so the common law would apply, not UCC Article 2. How about a contract for the sale of a hotel with the furniture included in the transaction? This is, of course, normally what would happen when a hotel is sold. The land and building are sold to the buyer, but the buyer probably, if he wants to continue using the uh, building as a hotel, will probably also want the beds, the dressers, the televisions, the tables and the chairs, and all the other items of furniture that are, you usually see at a hotel. Is this a hybrid transaction involving a sale of goods together with something else? Or is it a transaction involving only a sale of goods or only a sale of real estate? If it's a hybrid transaction, then the predominant purpose test applies. And you'd have to apply the predominant purpose test to determine whether the common law applied or whether UCC Article 2 applied. What do you think is the predominant purpose of this transaction? Is the furniture being sold to facilitate the sale of the land and building? Or is the land and building being sold incidentally to the transfer of the furniture? I think I know what the predominant purpose is. How about you? How about a contract to change the oil in a car? Is this a hybrid contract involving goods and services? Or is it a contract solely for services or solely for goods. If it's, a, if it's a hybrid contract, which predominates, the services of changing the oil or the transfer of ownership of the oil? How about a contract to sell and install new tires on a car? Is this a hybrid contract involving both a sale of goods combined with services or is it a contract solely, solely involving a sale of goods. Seventh, how about a contract to tow a car to the tire store? It occurs to me right away that I've entered into transactions almost like all of these, although I've never bought a hotel. Is a contract to tow a car to the tire store one involving any goods at all? If not, then, uh, then it's not a hybrid transaction, and the common law would apply, because it's purely for services. Now go back and determine the likely predominant purpose for numbers 4, 5, and 6, which are hybrid contracts. Do you see why these are hybrids and why the others are not? You might be a little bit curious about number 2, is that a hybrid contract, or is it solely a contract to sell goods? When you're done, go through the scope of UCC Article 2 worksheet and figure out which of the transactions on the worksheet are pure sales of goods with nothing else beside a sale of goods involved, which ones are pure services or purely something else, like the sale of a land and building, and which ones are hybrid transactions to which the predominant purpose test must be applied. For the ones that you decide are hybrid transactions, try to figure out whether the UCC Article 2 applies or whether the common law governs the transaction.